sustainable or unsustainable. So I want to ask you to join me in welcoming Bill Rees for his talk tonight. Thank you. We advertise ourselves as an intelligent species, a species capable of logical thought. We pretend that we are capable of forward planning. I teach in a planning school. Uh, we act as if we are compassionate toward others. Uh, recently there's been a great increase in the interest in human compassion. And yet if you look at the way we behave on the international stage, there's not much evidence of intelligence, <laughs> forward planning, or compassion. And I think perhaps the most recent uh, global example would be the, in my view, gross failure of the Copenhagen uh, talks around climate change. So the question to me is, well, what is going on here? Why is it that our self-image, uh, this notion that we are evidence of intelligent life on Earth, uh, seems to deviate so much from the facts of the matter? Now, obviously, much of what I'm going to say is open to interpretation, and that's fair enough. Uh, I'm just going to give you my interpretation that comes to me as a biologist teaching though with uh, sociologists and economists and political scientists and so on. So a lot of their thinking has rubbed off on me and I've simply tried to insert a perspective that isn't all that common out there into the whole debate around global change and particularly humankind's relationship uh, to that change, uh, the fact that we have become the primary driver. Um, th this is one of the early earlier, more, I suppose, strident warnings of the difficulty we seem to be in, going way back to 1992, the year of the Rio Conference on Environment and Development, which didn't get very far, and I think in some ways this uh, statement was a response to that. This is the Union of Concerned Scientists issuing a warning to humanity. Um, many of the Nobel laureates in science signed on to this particular document, but the bottom line is pretty clear. A great change in our stewardship of the earth and life on it is required if vast misery is to be avoided and our global home is not to be irretrievably mutilated. That's not the usual modest reserved uh, language of science. And so this is a rather outs outspoken statement coming as it does from the Union of Concerned Scientists. If you were to plot global events against the time that this particular statement came out, you would notice it had no effect whatsoever. So if we can leap ahead. This is uh, a much more recent statement, a decade and a half later from the Millennium Ecosystem a Summary Report. I was a part of this document as were 10,000 other uh, scientists around the planet. The largest study ever taken of the state of the world's ecosystems, the systems that sustain human existence. And again, it comes out with a stark warning that human activity is putting such a strain on the natural functions of the earth that the ability of the planet's ecosystems to sustain human endeavor that can no longer be taken for granted. Now again, not a, a, a reserve statement. The problem again is that if we plot the actual impact of humankind on the planet, you cannot see any evidence of an awakening, of a coming to consciousness of the reality of that relationship, if indeed it is real. This is just a, a, a plot of the human ecological footprint. Now, this is something again that I've developed with my students. I want to define it for you. Your ecological footprint is simply the area of productive ecosystems required to produce the resources that you consume and to assimilate your waste output. And it's an exclusive area. Obviously the green land that you use can't be used by me. So we're all competing with each other for the limited biocapacity of the planet, whether we're conscious of it or not. Uh, here is the simple reality. The average human needs about two hectares to sustain the average lifestyle on Earth. Um, that includes the assimilation of carbon dioxide and other waste, but primarily uh, then its consumption in the third world, waste production to a very large extent enters into this in the first world. Canadians use about eight hectares. So we're four times above the world average. Americans almost 10 hectares, about 10 or five times above the world average. The point then is that the earth is growing in population. 
the per capita footprint, consumption is increasing even faster. And so we pass sometimes in the 1980s the point at which the average consumption on Earth exceeded the average capacity of the planet to maintain that level of consumption. So if you add up the total aggregate human ecological footprint, it is greater than the biocapacity of the planet. Now you can ask, well, how can that be? How can we be consuming more than there is? And the answer is by drawing down the bank account. Ecosystems are like bank accounts. They're productive assets. A fish stock will produce an annual interest of catchable fish without being depleted. A forest adds a couple of percent a year in terms of total biomass. We can harvest that sustainably. But if your forest is adding biomass at the rate of 2% per year and you're harvesting at 4 and 5 and 6% per year, you're depleting that asset. You've exceeded the productive capacity of the forest or the fish stock or the soil or whatever it might be. So we're in a state of overshoot, exceeding the productive capacity and assimilative capacity of the planet. That's what climate change is all about. More carbon dioxide then can be assimilated by the <coughs> photosynthetic processes of green plants. And for that reason, we can be in a state of overshoot for some considerable time before uh, a collapse is induced. Things are getting worse. This is a, a, a quote from a paper just a few months ago, well, I guess toward the end of 2008, so it's over a year old now. It was one of the very first papers in the science of climate literature which actually made a political statement. Scientists are generally uh, uh, refrain from getting engaged in political debate. They like to believe that their work is value neutral. They simply put it out there to be assessed by the people and by politicians. Uh, in this case, uh, Anderson was slapped on the wrist for having gotten his nose a little bit too far into the political pie. But the point is that the statement stands as a pretty remarkable one in the scientific literature. This study indicated that by examining uh, previously unaccounted for sources of carbon emissions and a number of other things that aren't included in the um, standard models, that we're on a track to reach about 650 parts per million of carbon dioxide equivalents in the atmosphere later in this century. The pre-industrial level was 280 parts. We're already at 390 parts and the trajectory is an accelerating one. The rate of increase is increasing every year. At 650 parts per million, we can anticipate a global uh, temperature increase on average of about 4 degrees Celsius by the end of this century. To avoid this, they argued, that unless we can reconcile economic growth with unprecedented rates of decarbonization, we need to be reducing by about 6% per year our use of fossil fuels. Uh, the only way to do this <clears throat> in the present structure of the economy with current technologies is to talk about a planned economic recession, a planned withdrawal uh, from nature in the sense that uh, we cannot continue to sustain current levels of impact and ex expect to, to survive. This is what a four degree world would look like. Um, the yellow and brown bits are areas that become virtually uninhabitable. The brown is uh, virtually well, desert, essentially. Uh, the yellow is uh, much dried out. Um, <clears throat> and you can see from this that China, India, uh, much of South America, Africa, areas where th three, four billion people live will become virtually uninhabitable if this particular model is correct. Uh, this means massive translocations of people, uh, migrations of tens or hundreds of millions of people from their uh, homes by the end uh, of this century. We're by no means prepared even to discuss this kind of possibility in polite company. Uh, certainly it's not something that uh, the <coughs> Harper government in Ottawa would even allow to be uh, brought forward for a point of discussion. But I bring it to your attention because it is serious science and just a year ago Australia looked pretty much like this. The southern part of the country, which had never reached 40 degrees Celsius before, was seeing temperatures of 47, 48 degrees, uh, for example, in the Melbourne region. Uh, eight of the ten hottest days in the instrumental record occurred in the same ten 
day period in uh, Tasmania, the little island state at the very southern end of Australia. So every now and then we see a portent of the future uh, occurring locally uh, and uh, the problem is that if we see a four degree world, the kind of situation that happened in Australia a year ago will become more or less normal if the science is correct. And believe it or not, despite the enormous efforts and hundreds of millions of dollars spent by uh, big coal and big oil to deny the uh, correctness of the basic science, there's no reason, in fact, to um, doubt that the basic science, particularly the greenhouse effect, which has been understood, understood clearly since the middle part of the 19th century, there's no reason to hold it in doubt. Incidentally, in just the last 50 years, the area that we call the tropics has expanded by about 275 kilometers on each margin toward the poles. So as the earth warms up, we're seeing in the migration of species, in the uh, shift of climate belts, the effects today. It's not a question, is global warming occurring? It is occurring, full stop, period. You can dispute a little bit, perhaps, how much human effect there is in that observation, uh, but I think the only uh, what we call forcing mechanisms sufficiently strong to explain the climate change observations to date is the increase in greenhouse gases in the atmosphere since the beginning of the industrial age. There are lots of other factors but none of them have changed nearly so much as that single factor for which humans are responsible. So just think about that if you're harboring a climate change doubts and try to reconcile it with your doubts. Now, I started out in my introductory remarks by asking this question. In the face of the evidence and our non-response to it, how can we claim to be intelligent? We have this unique capacity for logical reasoning, for forward planning, for compassion toward other species and other human beings, and yet uh, we don't seem to exercise that very much. No corporate entity, no national government, no major international organization has begun to take seriously or at least to act in a way that reflects the seriousness of the scientific data that suggests human beings are changing the nature of the ecosphere in ways that may not be amenable to the future of human civilization. That's simply the facts of the matter as I see them. And the question then arises, why is this? If we're all of those things, if we have these unique qualities as humans and yet fail to respond to evidence that our own action is putting us at risk, what's going on here? And so perhaps naturally enough as a biologist I fall back on my biological roots. And I remember reading and having a light go on in my head when Theodosius Dobzhansky, this goes way back to the 70s actually, wrote in a paper and later a whole I guess it was a phrase in a paper and then he put a whole paper out basically on this topic that nothing in biology makes sense unless you can interpret it through the uh, lens of evolution. Now if we can go on, I argued that human beings are products of evolution. The human brain is a product of human evolution. A human social behavior. We are social animals. We're not individual uh, animals, solitary organisms. We're social organisms. That's a fact that comes to us from the evolved nature of our neurosystems. We are not solitary. We're social organisms. Most of our instinctive behaviors derive from the brain. So given that we're um, uh, as much a product of evolution as a slime mold, there's no reason to think that uh, everything in human affairs, nothing in human affairs rather, makes sense, except in the light of evolution. Now I'm not for a moment saying that that's the only quadrant in which we can extract valuable information to explain human affairs, but it's something that we don't think of. So what I want to do is to at least open the possibility that in what we are observing here, here, this disconnect between what we claim to be and the way we act may in fact reside in something that we aren't conscious of uh, precisely because we tend not to want to think of ourselves as just another species. It's an insult to people to think that they are merely an animal. For example, 
So what I'm going to argue for the next few minutes is that whether you like it or not, folks, we are the product of evolution, and our evolution is controlled, as the evolution of other species is, by our genetic makeup, but also, and more so than in any other species, by something we call our mimetic makeup. Genes are nuggets of biological information or genetic information that can be passed from one generation to the next. A meme is a nugget of cultural information that can be passed from one generation to the next, but also within the generation. Memes accumulate over time. Cultural information accumulates. Technology improves. The libraries get fuller. We acquire more and more knowledge. And we act out of that knowledge as much as we act out of our genes. So human evolution is a codependent product of the interaction of genetic information and the mimetic information that is a reflection of our culture. Now the second premise here is that, you know, we think of ourselves at the pinnacle of evolution, but we're just, you know, part way there. We are continuing to evolve as are all other species. We're incomplete. We're not perfect. We aren't completely intelligent. We're not completely instinctive. We're in transition between a species controlled almost automatically by the impulses that are innately uh, acquired and that, uh, um, say, a, a very primitive organism, a lizard or a snake, might primarily act out of instinct. We may primarily, or at least we think we primarily, act out of higher intelligence. So there's a whole gradient here and we're somewhere in the middle. If we can look at the structure of the human brain, there is some uh, purely physical evidence of what I'm suggesting here. One of the most, I suppose, dramatic expressions of this came to us from uh, John McLean about three or four decades ago, who proposed the human brain is a triune organism. Now, it's not as simple as this, but in general, his thesis has proved to be quite robust to tests. And what we can argue from this thesis is that there are three large subcomponents of the brain, each with its own kind of intelligence. The reptilian brain stem at the very bottom here is the old brain. Now keep in mind that human beings are a species of vertebrate organism uh, that shares in its personal development in our ontogeny, the same kinds of transition states as do other organisms that are vertebrate animals. And as the human organism evolved over time, we obviously had to start from where we were. So at one point when we were much closer to reptiles, the brain basically had that structure. When mammals evolved, they added to that structure. They didn't abandon the instinctive centers of the brain. The, down here is where all the automatic functions take place. You're not conscious of having to breathe. You don't control your heart rate. It's all taken care of for you automatically down there, as it is in other much more primitive organisms. So as mammals evolved, they acquired this middle brain where our limbic system resides. And this is the seat of our emotions and our uh, affection for one another. The, the feelings, responses to food, sex, and so on and so forth come from that part of the brain. Humans have added, more than any other organism, something called the neocortex, the third great layer, as it were. And this is the seat of our intelligence, our capacity for forward planning, our capacity for compassion, uh, our, the, the thought centers, the language centers, and all of those so-called higher functions that we exhibit to a much greater extent than any other organism. So in many respects, humans have three brains, all operating at the same time, each influencing the other in a very tightly integrated way uh, so that at any point in time you may not even be conscious of which part of that brain is actually in control of your actions. There isn't a person in this room who hasn't given in to some emotion and then resented it or regretted it afterwards. There isn't anyone in this room who hasn't done something a shame hole that comes from the reptilian brain stem that they regretted afterwards. And there isn't anyone in this room who hasn't at some point made an intelligent decision to override some less, let's say, let's say more primitive urge and uh, therefore shown that we are capable on 
rare occasions of allowing our intelligence to override some of these other uh, more instinctive or emotional kinds of responses. So the point is, it's a big mixed up package and uh, we're perhaps in transition toward the upper end of the spectrum, but we ain't there yet in its entirety. So there's tension in this integrated mind. We think we are uniquely self-conscious and rational. So we live in that cerebrum but there are circumstances in which reason predominates and other circumstances in which it is, does not. And I'm going to argue that reason dominates in relatively trivial, trivial circumstances or unimportant ones. Okay? When your safety or your survival is at stake, when your socioeconomic status is at stake, when your political position is at stake, you will fight to conserve and retain your prestige, your wealth, your power, and you're not often and or even usually acting out of intelligence. It's much more instinctive or emotional at that level. So what I'm arguing is then that under these circumstances, innate behavioral propensities that operate beneath consciousness in the midbrain and reptilian brainstem will override your rational behavior. Passion and instinct will trump reason in many, many circumstances in both ordinary people's lives and certainly in the political arena. We see it daily on the news. It's not as if this is news. It, 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 I, I put it in kind of a modern context. If there's anything to, if not literally the, the triune brain and this mixed brain model, and then, you know, going back hundreds of years, the philosopher Mirandola recognized in human behavior behaviors exactly the kinds of tensions that I've been uh, uh, talking about. This is the Renaissance philosopher. Uh, man was created by nature in such a way that nature, or rather that reason might dominate the senses. And by its law, the law of reason, all rage and desire of passion and lust might be restrained. So there's that tension again between the reasonable, rational man having to control the more instinctive and uh, passionate aspects of the character. And in fact, some would argue that God was invented as a kind of threat to make sure that we did this. So he he goes on to say, but when the image of God has been forgotten, we begin to serve the beasts within us. Uh, so again, it, it's this notion that we are this compound individual, that this uh, individual intention, and we create social constructs such as our religions to help reinforce the kinds of behaviors necessary for civilized existence to take place. Now Antonio Damasio, the second quote, is one of the most well-known neuroscientists uh, today, it studies the brain, brain function, the functions of the nervous system, and he's saying exactly the same thing, but in modern language. There are potions in our own bodies and our brains. The brain is a gland that generates hormones. It's the hormones that stimulate the kinds of behaviors that I was talking about a moment ago. So there are potions in our bodies and brains capable of forcing on us behaviors that we may or may not be able to suppress by strong resolution. So again, you've all been in situations where you know you shouldn't do that, but you go right ahead and do it anyway, because in that case you weren't able to suppress that strong emotion uh, by acting rationally. Mirandola and Damasio, although they were 500 years apart, are really tapping into the same sensibilities about the nature of the human organism. Okay. This is the best cartoon I've ever seen in my life. I wish I could uh, credit the, uh, uh, I don't know, Mac off, I guess. I'm not sure where it appeared. But here it is. Th this is our modern world. And it's, it's every morning I think of this cartoon when I read the paper. Because the first section will be full of the latest, uh, you know, climate event or catastrophic collapse of this or the soils are eroding there or something da -da -da and so on. But on the business pages, there's not a hint that they're even in the same planet, right? So here we have a Chamber of Commerce meeting in which the guest speaker has uh, obviously been reading both parts of the paper. He doesn't want to disappoint anyone, however he said. And so while the end of the world scenario is rife with unimaginable horror, we believe that the pre-end period is filled with unprecedented opportunities for profit. <laughs> now, the whole 
of the greening of business, in my view, uh, fits nicely into this particular uh, characterization. When we look at many so-called green enterprises, they're nothing of the kind. It's, it's a kind of a greenwash over what they were doing anyway. To, and, and I've been in a number of meetings where I've heard senior executives say, of course we're interested in sustainability. And so we're becoming, we're greening our company. But as soon as it starts to negatively affect the bottom line, we're out of here. That's a direct quote from a senior executive in a corporate entity right here in Vancouver. So this is not far removed from the kind of truth again uh, that I'm, I'm trying to get us toward. So the private sector is responding to the profit potential in the massive trade in carbon credits, for example. If you think about uh, what has been the principal response of nations to the rapid melting of floating ice in the high Arctic? to move in and claim territory to get at the oil that's causing the problem in the first place. So it doesn't matter where you look, you see these tensions and these manifestations of this uh, conflicting uh, neurological disorder that we have emerging. I'm arguing, for the sake of, of, of getting you all excited here, that unsustainability, that the state that we now find ourselves, is an inevitable emergent property of the interaction of the human species as we currently think, okay, it's, it's the modern mind interacting with nature. Because the way we think in terms of the beliefs, values, and assumptions under which we operate, particularly in our economies, are so far removed from the way in which natural systems function that there is no way that you can compatibly integrate the two. So if you have two systems that are so fundamentally different in their structure and operation and try to merge them together, unsustainability is an inevitable emergent property. I'm going to argue that both genes, that is to say our natural genetic behavior, as well as our cultural uh, belief set is involved in this. And I'm going to further argue that the behavioral adaptations, or rather the behavioral drivers in this, the innate qualities, were once adaptive. They stood us well 50,000 years ago when the environment was relatively constant. But when we're in a situation of rapid environmental change, they're no longer adaptive. So we have literally made ourselves maladaptive to the very ecological or environmental conditions that we ourselves have created. Okay. Now, here's the kicker, and there's plenty of evidence in our history. What happens if a genetic mutation is maladaptive to the environment in which the organism carrying that mutation finds itself? Well, it's wiped out. Okay. So if you have a maladaption, a maladaptation, you will not survive. If you think in a maladaptive way, if your mimetic constructs, if your cultural paradigm, if your worldview, if your ideology is inappropriate to the circumstances in which you are expressing that ideology, you will be selected out. So I'm arguing here that just as bad genes are removed by natural selection, so can bad memes, mimetic constructs, be removed by natural selection. And that's the basis for arguing that whole societies have failed, have collapsed historically because they refused to change their beliefs, values, and assumptions in the face of contrary knowledge. Now where did we start this? We are seeing knowledge uh, from many, many disciplines piling up to show that we're on a wrong tack. And yet we do not respond because we stick rigidly to a particular set of beliefs, values, and assumptions about the economy, about growth, about uh, a whole variety of things that are completely at odds with the nature of the reality within which we find ourselves embedded. So we're no different from previous cultures that have gone down as a result of that dilemma. So let's then look in detail at the drivers I'm, I'm talking about here. Human beings, as I said, are evolved species, just like any other. What happens if you drop a single bacterium on a petri dish of nutrients? 
it becomes a colony and within a few days under ideal conditions it will completely cover that petri dish. It'll just keep replicating and replicating every 15 or 20 minutes until all the resources are used up and the entire space is covered and then it dies out. Actually the bacteria cells have the advantage of being able to sporulate and then they blow away to find another petri dish or dead fruit or whatever it might be. But the point is every species has two a tendencies that humans share. The first is the a tendency to expand to fill all the potential habitat. What do you think is these species, the large scale vertebrate species, with the largest geographical range on the planet? Okay, it's sitting in your seats. <laughs> Okay. So we are just much better because of our intellect, our cumulative mimetic endowment at exploiting the habitats on this planet so that no habitat that is even remotely capable of sustaining human life does not have it. We are there in numbers on every habitable landscape on earth. And we will, like other species, use up all available resources. Now this one a lot of people <clears throat> have problems with because they'll point out this or that indigenous culture that has not destroyed its habitat. And I would argue that in the case of humans, whether or not we are able to use all the resources is technology dependent. How many of you own a credit card? Okay, not only will humans use up all available resources, but when you run out of resources, you will invent one called a piece of plastic, which enables you to use up even more resources that don't yet exist, and you have to go out and earn to pay down your credit card. This is a predisposition. How many of you have gone to a buffet, eaten your fill, and said, that's it, this is the last canapé I'm going to touch? And within three minutes, you're back there, almost unconsciously. <laughs> eating. And, and you know, you've done this, haven't you? You've picked it and got it in your own, damn, I wasn't going to do that. Well, guess what's working, you see? That's that little reptilian brainstem just trying to stuff you because, you see, under primitive conditions, you wouldn't leave food lying around. It would rot. So there was an advantage to cramming yourself as full as you could when you had the food available and packing it onto your butt and your tongue for those lean times. It is by no accident that the northern hemisphere, well I shouldn't say that any longer, that the rich people on this planet have among their numbers, of course there aren't any in this room, but about a billion people who are obese precisely because they cannot keep their fingers out of the cookie bowl. We will use the available resources to which we have access. There are another billion people who are malnourished at the other end of the income spectrum, all of which is just to illustrate a simple point. We're no different from other species. We'll use all the habitat and we'll consume all the resources. We are also uh, characterized by certain qualities that, that uh, make us out to be what is called a K-strategist by biologists. Uh, different species have different strategies by which to propagate themselves. Some do so by having an inordinate growth rate or potential growth rate. They produce prodigious numbers of eggs or seeds. So if you think of a codfish that may be um, two meters long, a big full female, 30,000, 60,000 eggs. Uh, if you think of a, uh, an, uh, an older tree, one of our more adapted uh, opportunistic tree species in this area, thousands and thousands of winged seeds. They're called R strategists, R for rate. They get by by just spreading seeds all over the environment and not one tiny fraction of 1% ever grows. That's all you need, one to replace the tree, but billions of seeds or eggs go out there. So that's a strategy. We're way over at the other end of the spectrum called K strategists. Our strategists tend to have short lives, prodigious reproductive potential, no parental care whatsoever. Uh, codfish do not look after their 60,000 offspring, for example. Uh, K strategists, long lives, relatively large, low reproduction rate, large degrees of parental care, high survival. Uh, most of our offspring survive today, for example. And so humans are characteristic K strategists. Now what K strategists do always is press up against the carrying capacity of their habitats. This was Malthus's great insight. Humankind will press up 
against the carrying capacity, the food limits, whatever it might be, of their habitat. So this is exponential growth. We tend to follow that, but then as we approach the capacity of our environments, the population growth rate declines because resource depletion, pollution of the environment, overcrowding, other symptoms of this nature. So humans are classical case strategies, always with that tendency to press up, which simply again is another way of saying we will occupy all the habitat and use all the resources. Here's the evidence. I, okay, now I want you to quickly flash back and forth between the previous slide and this one. Notice this part of the curve, okay, and the leveling out. We go to the, this is the real growth of the human population when the cap of carrying capacity has been removed. So for the longest period of time, humans survived at carrying capacity. In fact, we could draw this way, way back there, a flat line for 50,000 years. There were ups and downs as civilizations or local communities rose and fell, but for the most part, um, growth is not a persistent phenomenon in human or any case strategist population. Then we found oil. And oil gave us access to everything else. More food, more resources of every kind to create the infrastructure we needed to sustain more and more people, and so more and more people came along. This explosion of human beings is unprecedented for any species, and certainly unprecedented for human beings. It's what we think of as normal, but look at the data. Only eight generations of people have really experienced a consistent period of growth, sufficient so that they would notice it really in their lifetimes. Okay. Almost everything important about modern technology didn't exist when I was born. Certainly not that camera, or these computers or projectors or anything. Change is just inordinately fast today. It's a unique period in history. It's only been since the 1950s that any government on planet Earth has taken growth to be an important part of its economic platform. Do you realize that? Only since the 1950s has economic growth been the part of any official government economic platform. It took us, you know, five or six generations to really figure out that we could use this. So the point I'm really getting at here is that what each of us in this room takes to be the norm, of course growth is normal, we need three or four percent just to keep the economy on its feet, is really the single most abnormal phenomenon in the history of our species. Now again, there have been other cultures that have risen or fallen, but the time dimensions are different and the scale is different. Well, up until this is uh, 2,000 years ago, there were less than 200 a million people on the entire planet. And it had been that way for thousands of years and continues to be that way for almost 2,000 more years before this incredible explosion in just the last 150 years. So in the 20th century, we saw a fourfold increase in human numbers in just 100 years alone. Completely unprecedented. And if you remember that this will always flatten out at some point and then perhaps come down, which is what we want to avoid, it's inevitable. What goes up, even in population, must at some point uh, come down. Now, just a couple of things. So some of you may yet be thinking, well, surely we don't use all resources. There's actually been studies of the history of human resource exploitation. One of the more famous ones was undertaken by three of my colleagues at UBC in the 90s. This is a quote from an article in Science. Although there's considerable variation in detail, there's remarkable consistency in the history of resource exploitation. Resources are inevitably overexploited, often to the point of collapse or extinction. That that is a fact of human uh, resource exploitation as our technology improves and we will take the last one unless powerfully restrained by international regulation or some other form of, of uh, this is where federalism uh, comes in at either the global or national you need a basis in law to inhibit what humans would otherwise do naturally okay so that's the history next 
here is a perfect example of non-response to science. This is not a short time period. From 1962 to 1992 is a 30-year period during which Canada had uh, management responsibility for the world's largest fishery, a fishery that had sustained human uh, fishing for hundreds if not thousands of years. And we watched over that period of time the steady decline in the spawning stock biomass to the point where it collapsed in 1992, now 18 years ago. We stopped fishing and the stock has not recovered. Now the fish haven't disappeared, they haven't gone extinct, but the impact of human exploitation has so altered the ecosystem structure that the fish can no longer, uh, as it were, exploit or, or retain the niche that they once occupied within that particular ecosystem. So it's not clear that that stock will ever recover without some other um, knock of some kind or other pushing them back into that original state. But this is a shameful example of ignoring the scientific data that something is awry here. I won't go into the details, but it was quite clear for many, many years before the collapse actually occurred. Well, uh, a, a group of scientists examined, compared human beings to uh, 96 other species very similar to humans in their ecological requirements. And they measured a dozen different qualities or characteristics. And they found that in almost every case, humans were the outlier. So what this graph shows is a, a distribution of these 96 species uh, according to their appropriation of biomass. So how much do these species eat, basically? And what it shows is a normal distribution, a log normal distribution actually. These are humans out here. So the other 95 species are over here. Human beings are way out here. Two orders of magnitude more biomass extracted from our ecosystems than by the highest species. Well, this is the 95% confidence limits. So we're way, way out there eating a couple of hundred times more stuff than species at the 95th percentile out on the edge. So this is quite an astonishing a mark of human competitive superiority on the one hand, but also a mark of our capacity to overexploit the ecosystems of which we are a part. Okay. Now, that's all biology. What has culture got to do with this? Because I'm often berated by sociologists and uh, political scientists for underplaying the role of, of culture. Now look, there's a hell of a lot more sociologists and political scientists out there promoting culture, and there's very few biologists who are willing to stick their neck out the way I am. So I don't apologize for trying to put the biological argument forward. But I want to now bring in the cultural and show that it actually reinforces the biological. So. This is actually a combination of culture and biology. Humans are a myth-making species. Cult uh, sociologists talk about the cultural narrative. Every culture has its narrative, its origin myth, its destination myth, and a whole lot of other mythic constructs that make us behave and so on and so forth. All right, so we need stories. In fact, it's the shared mythologies, the shared stories that make this group different from that group. And look at how this disrupts geopolitics. You've got the Muslim group of myths in conflict with the Christian group of myths. And these myths are extraordinarily powerful, enough to get people to go out and blow themselves up in support of their particular mythic construct. I'm sorry if I'm offending anyone here, but the myths that we believe in are more powerful than even the survival instinct. That's how powerful the need for mythic constructs are in the human organism. And they are a very dominant force or prevailing force in geopolitics even today. We in the Western scientific tradition are no less myth-bound than any other culture. In fact, I would argue that the notion that we are a science-based culture is our biggest cultural myth. <laughs> It, it simply enables us to ignore the reality uh, that we actually don't behave that way at all. And there's been lots written about this. I, I recommend a very readable, accessible little book by a, a theologian from Mount Allison University back east, uh, Colin Grant, simply called Myths We Live By. It's a wonderful story about the human propensity for myth-making. Okay.
Okay, so here are a couple of examples or statements of the current increasingly global cultural myth. So this is one that emerged with that explosion of the post-enlightenment industrial revolution in Europe and is now spreading around the world. It's the perpetual growth myth, the myth of progress. The idea that you can have unlimited growth, economic material growth, on a finite planet. Lawrence Summers, the author of this first statement, was the president of the World Bank when he made this statement in the early 1990s. Does anyone know his current position? All right. That's right. That's right. He is uh, President Obama's chief economic advisor. Okay. He is the chair of the U.S. President's Council of Economic Advisors. Lawrence Summers says, there are no limits to the carrying capacity of Earth. Remember that humans tend to press up against, well, he wouldn't believe there's any limits, so we can just go on forever, that are likely to bind at any time in the foreseeable future. The idea that we should put limits on growth because of some natural limit is a profound error with staggering social costs. Now it has staggering social costs <clears throat> because we use growth as the means by which to solve the problem of poverty. See, if we can grow sufficiently so that even the thinnest slice of the pie is large enough to keep people going, then they won't bug us to share. <laughs> so growth becomes a means by which we can avoid the question of more equitable distribution of the world's biological and economic output. And just to show that he's not alone, a couple <clears throat> years later, and you know, today one of the still mo my most frequently quoted individuals is the late uh, Professor uh, Julian Simon from Maryland University, University of Maryland School of Business. Technology exists now to produce in inexhaustible quantities all the products made by nature. We have in our hands now the technology to feed, clothe, and supply energy to an ever-growing population for the next seven billion years. Now, again, not a modest statement, but the point is these kinds of statements are repeated over and over again by people who believe in the progress myth and the myth of infinite growth. This is a statement by a marketing expert in the mid-50s. In the post-war period, there was a lot of idle uh, factories and idle labor, uh, returning soldiers who didn't have enough to do, and factories that had been making tanks and guns and ships. Let's employ that capital in a productive way. But in order to do that, we had to break people out of the conserver habits that they had gotten into. So that people had gone through the depression, they'd gone through the rationing of the Second World War, they were getting used to living on very little. And by the way, they'd never been happier. <laughs> Suddenly, we've got a big problem. People aren't working hard enough. There's underemployed capital. So let's organize to create a new social mythology explicitly on purpose to make people into consumers. All right. So this is one of the most prolific writers of the period. He was a marketing expert. Our enormous productive economy demands that we make consumption a way of life, that we convert the buying and use of goods into rituals, that we seek our spiritual satisfaction, our ego satisfaction in consumption. We need things consumed, burned up, worn out, replaced, and discarded at an ever-increasing rate. And so began the history of the so-called consumer society, a deliberate social construction that gave birth to the modern uh, advertising industry and uh, the compulsion that we all now uh, seem to have uh, to go to the store. The single most popular part of spare time activity in North America is shopping at the mall, if you interview uh, people in a certain age group. So they were were very successful in creating uh, consumers of us all and this is now spreading around the world. As consumption increases, because we now have an increasing numbers of billions of consumers and population is stro still growing at about 1% per year, then the impact that we measure by the ecological footprint is population times per capita consumption is continually arising. It passes carrying capacity. That's the Malthusian dilemma. We don't notice because we can appropriate goods and services from all over the planet after we've used up all of our own. 
So we overshoot, and the question is, is this decline going to be a planned, reasonable, slow, soft landing, or is it going to be a crash imposed by uh, real limits when we hit the, the wall? And here's the problem, uh, the other side of the problem. I keep going back and forth between the cultural, economic, or, or, and uh, the, the biological. This is the latest numbers I could get my hands on from the World Bank on the distribution of income on planet Earth today. Now keep in mind that when the growth dynamic got underway, uh, really about 50 years ago, and became the primary means by which to obviate poverty, you would think that we would pay attention to the impact of that growth on poverty. But what we see here is that as of right now, the world's richest 20%, the 20% of the population who are the wealthiest on Earth, and by the way, every one of us in this room is in that category, right? We use about 76.6%. We get all that much of the world income, actually consume about 80% of world output. The poorest 20% of people on Earth get by on one and a one half percent of global output. And those ratios are worsening. So the question is, if you are an intelligent species, if growth is being designed as a means of reducing poverty, uh, why is it that we can go for 30 years in a failed experiment and not pay attention to the fact that it's not solving the problem that we set out to do? So the share of the private consumption by the poor is in decline. Most world growth goes to the rich who don't even benefit from it. Okay. Why is this problematic? Because if we're already at carrying capacity, but we're about 25 to 30 percent over carrying capacity, and it's 20 percent of the world's people who use 80 percent of everything, that, that right away shows you that we've got a problem. If everyone on the planet today consumed at the level of North Americans, we'd need the equivalent of four additional Earth-like planets to produce all those resources and to assimilate all of those wastes. Now, if you don't believe that, just think about it in terms of two nations. The United States has 4.7% of the world's population. 4.7% of the world's people. It uses between 20 and 25% of everything. About 22 or 3% of petroleum, for example. China has over four times the US population. Now, see what I'm saying here? If China achieves its goal of the same material standard as is now enjoyed by Americans, US plus China is 125% of the entire global economic and um, biological output. And you haven't even begun to count countries like Canada, Europe, India, Africa, and so on and so forth. So that's why we have fair confidence in the kinds of numbers that our footprint work uh, shows to be the case. We cannot, by any stretch of the imagination, reach a, uh, um, a stable, sustainable state through growth of the world economy uh, such that everyone uh, achieves the material standards to po even pull them out of poverty, let alone live like North Americans. Okay. So the really inconvenient truth, which we do not wish to discuss, and certainly is not on any uh, political platform to date, are these ones. This is actually a statement from the World Business Council on Sustainable Development, or at least the output of a workshop they held in the early 90s in Antwerp, Belgium, looking at the uh, data on uh, material resource trends, uh, pollution around the earth, matching this against productive and carrying capacity. That workshop concluded that in the industrial world, reductions of up to 90% would be required by the middle of this century in order to enable necessary growth to occur in the third world and to keep the whole within the carrying capacity of the planet.
So this is now a, a version of what we call contraction and convergence. We in the rich countries have got to slow down, in fact reduce our consumption to create the ecological space necessary for the deservedly, uh, those who deserve to grow uh, so that they can come up to a decent standard. Keep in mind there's now officially a billion people on earth who are malnourished, another two billion who don't get sufficient, that's calorically malnourished, and probably another two billion who are deficient in some dietary standard or other. So we don't notice because we've always had plenty in this resource rich part of the planet, uh, but the fact is that half the people on earth are still living the Malthusian dilemma. We should be designing a smaller uh, equitable steady state economy that maintains itself within carrying capacity. Not, this is not difficult. Is it? The concepts are easy. The getting there is the difficult part because of the conflictual nature of the human animal. Now many people are horrified at the thought that we would have to shrink. But there's plenty of evidence to show that this shouldn't be a problem if we really were an intelligent species. Here is a graph from a book called The Loss of Happiness in Market Democracies by Robert T. Lane. What Lane documents here is the lack of any correlation, any uh, continuous correlation between felt well-being, be between people's sense of happiness, uh, security in the future and all of that, and rising incomes. So th this happens to be data from the United States. So from 1940 to 1990 there was an increase in U.S. per capita GDP in adjusted dollar terms from six to twenty thousand dollars per capita. But during that whole time, the numbers of people reporting themselves to be happy or very happy was in steady decline. So that we see no connection between rising incomes and happiness through that entire period. In fact, if you were acting logically and happiness was your goal, remember in the U.S. Constitution it's the pursuit of happiness that you're supposed to be after, then you'd want to get back here to $6,000 per year as soon as possible to increase the happiness quotient. If we look, that was an object, or, uh, a subjective indicator. If you plot objective indicators of well-being, we see much the same thing. So this is a plot of longevity versus income in the world's countries. Now economists are quite correct that rising incomes uh, produce benefits, but only up to a point. And so what we see here is that countries with almost no income or very impoverished countries, these are the ones with those eco footprints of less than a hectare or so, have very low life expectancy. But as they get richer, this curve rises, but it doesn't rise indefinitely. It flattens out at about 10,000 international uh, dollars per year, purchasing power parity adjusted. After that, there's no response. So that countries that are way out here, at $60,000 per year, that's Luxembourg, aren't doing any better than a country down here at ten or $12,000 a year. So again, no correlation between indicators of population health and income beyond a certain point. The United States per cap or ex life expectancy is now in decline, even as incomes rise, as the quality of the average health of the population declines with uh, excess consumption and so on and so forth. So again, what this curve says is we should be, since it is the case, that economic growth is doing two things. It's destroying the biological basis of our existence and People out here aren't benefiting from that growth. We saw that in the last slide. So it should be redirected to the people over here who can benefit from it. Okay. So it's a redirect contraction and convergence again. Moreover, we might say, what's the optimal scale of the economy? It's an economy that produces 10, 12,000 purchasing power parity adjusted dollars per annum. Once you've reached that point, you don't need further growth. You should work half a we can go home and play with your kids for the other half. Or go sailing or cycling or take a walk. Meet your wife once in a while, or husband as the case may be. So there's lots of room here greatly to improve the quality of your life even as your income drops without for a moment changing your longevity, life. Uh, we've done this with infant mortality rates, uh, post-operative survival, a whole array of indicators remain very high 
uh, even if we lose three quarters of our income. So when we talk about reducing our footprints by 80%, that would mean coming from here down to here with no change in the quality, the objective quality of our existence. That's not such a bad deal if in the meantime you help out a bunch of impoverished people. Remember, we're compassionate. Right? And we stop destroying the planet. Hey, that's a good idea. So, question, what would an intelligent species do? <laughs> it would start talking about the optimal scale of the economy. What is the appropriate level of consumption to maximize health? to maximize the capacity of people to self-actualize, to use a yuppie phrase of a few years ago. Well, we don't ask those questions because we're all caught up in this incredible scramble to hang on to the jobs we've got and compete other people out of the planet and uh, keep working ourselves into the grave. So the good news is we actually could and we have the technology to enable that 75 to 80 percent reduction while actually improving the quality of our life. The bad news is we don't act. Privileged elites who have the greatest stake in the status quo, those who will defend their political positions because they're operating from the reptilian brainstem, the wealthy who use the wealth as a... See, social status is far more important than the absolute quantity of wealth, but we'll defend that status to the last, okay? So that we don't act because the people in power have the most, they think, to lose by so acting. And they're the ones who can uh, literally control the levers of power. Power. The rest of us have been conned into participation in this insane suicidal path, right? We are the most socially engineered generation on the face of the earth. And every year, hundreds of millions, no, billions of dollars are spent to entrain you in the consumer cycle of unhappiness. What is advertising designed to do? To make you feel miserable about the car you bought last year, about the computer you have now that doesn't have like Vista, you're lucky, about what are, you see what I'm getting at. We, we plan to, to make ourselves unhappy. I think the advertising industry probably hires more psychologists who are figuring out all the time how to make you ashamed of your house, your car, your wife, your kids and whatever else so you can buy your way into the happiness that you, you might have. So we bought into it, lock, stock and barrel. Unfortunately we're not even aware of this. You see, it's, it's programmable. We're programmable and we're not even aware of it. That's the irony of it all. So in this kind of context, what I'm talking about as being scientifically necessary is politically unfeasible. Can you imagine being elected on a platform of reducing the economy by 80%? <laughs> it's not going to happen. It's not politically feasible. But what's politically feasible, the, 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 well, you know, carbon sequestration, um, carbon trading and all of that stuff has no effect whatsoever on, on the reality in which we're operating, at least not at present. It's scientifically irrelevant. Now again, I'm not saying anything that's really not new. There's a wonderful book I, I think you all should read. So when you go on half time, which I'm sure most of you will do as you leave the, here, you'll have much more time to read and educate yourself. But if you have a chance, Read Tuchman's March of Folly. Uh, Barbara Tuchman's a Pulitzer Prize winning uh, U.S. historian. Her March of Folly is a book about exactly what we're talking about. The historical evidence that throughout history governments operate against the interests of their constituents. Wooden headedness plays a remarkably large role in government. It consists, see if you recognize any of this now, it consists of assessing a situation in terms of preconceived fixed notions. Ideology, anyone? While ignoring any contrary signs. It is acting according to wish, while not allowing oneself to be deflected by the facts. That's what we've been talking about here. Uh, so she had it all together. Again, evidence that this is not news. Gustave Le Bon wrote about it in the late 19th century in his famous book on the crowd, a study of the popular mind. And he's talking about you folks. The masses have never thirsted after truth. They turn aside from evidence that is not to their taste, preferring to deify error. 
if error seduces them. And by the way, you know we're all seduced by the lifestyles to which we have been programmed to accept, right? Whoever can supply them with the illusions is easily their master. And anyone who attempts to destroy our illusions is the victim. We shoot the bearer of bad news. Okay? Max Planck, almost a hundred years later, famous physicist, made a very similar statement and it has to do with the human neuro neurology. The last slide gets to that. A new scientific truth does not triumph by convincing its opponents and making them see the light but rather because its opponents eventually die. And a new generation gl uh, grows up that is familiar with it. So the progress of ideas, once you become stuck in a particular way of thinking, very difficult to move on. That's what both of these statements really are saying. Finally, in the last well, couple of decades, n n neuroscientists and cognitive scientists have begun to discover the mechanism by which this is possible. Now it turns out that in the course of the development of the individual, young people growing up in a particular family situation, church situation, cultural situation, political ideology, you know if your families have always been liberals or whatever, you keep hearing the same kind of stuff repeated over and over and over again. You go to the same kinds of meetings and so on and so forth. And the point is that as the brain is developing, the repetition of pattern creates the, the synaptic circuit that comes into play whenever you think about those kinds of issues again. This is like use, uh, learning a musical instrument in a way. You know, I, know, I play oboe, I don't have to look at the notes to play, it's just all automatic because I've done it 157,000 times. Well our brains develop automatic circuitry right, as we grow. Now the point is then, subsequently, once you've got your ideology, once you've got your ideas, the foundational premises upon which you're going to act out your life in place, you can change them, but it's difficult. But the point is that once they're in place, people seek out compatible experiment, experiences. rather. And when faced with information that does not agree with these preformed synaptic circuits, we will deny, discredit, reinterpret, or forget that information. This is the nature of denial. Now, how many of you think of yourselves as interested in environmental and global political issues? How many of you are captains of industry? <laughs> All right, so I'm just proving my point. <laughs> that you are predisposed to having your views reinforced. So you come to meetings like this every Thursday night <laughs> on, on, during the month. But we seek out those experiences that reinforce what we want to hear and we deny, discredit, and generally reject contrary information. You see why we're so messed up as a species? Because the people who believe in A, B, and C will believe in A, B, and C until they die. And those of us in the minority who believe in X, Y, and Z aren't getting anywhere, and that's a big problem. So, this is my last slide. We have an unprecedented opportunity. Since we are mythic creatures, the opportunity that we have is to rewrite our cultural narrative in a way that takes us towards survival. We have to override the maladaptive tendencies. We have to move away from selfishness, com competition, and the kinds of behaviors that are dooming us to the kind of competitive struggle to the, you know, the last man, so to speak, on the planet, and to create a new cultural mythology that emphasizes our common interests, community values, and our shared, uh, well, interest in retaining the only planetary home that we have. Historically, it paid off to exploit your short-term selfish interests. Today, we, for the first time in the history of our species, reach the point where my selfish interests are identical to our collective interests. I cannot be sustainable on my own. No country can be sustainable on its own. If the rest of the world carries on down the current pathway, they will take us down with it. So, instead of being able to act out my own personal selfish fantasy, I've got to begin to identify my interests with your interests. Because together we can pull this off if we convince enough people that it is in their selfish interest to serve the collective interest. It's the only way 
that we're going to make any real difference on this planet. So a movement like the World Federalists, although I have you know problems with this or that dimension of it, is precisely the kind of direction we need to go at the level of creating a common cultural mythology across the planet that reinforces the inherent need that we have for a planet that works for our mutual benefit. It can't work if each of us decides always to appropriate the most we can in our short lifespan on Earth. Thanks so much for that.